Hello, and welcome back to another episode of International Immersion, a podcast that seeks to capture the combined experiences of people, places, culture, traveling, current events, living abroad, and much, much more. For today's episode, we are going to dive into something that's going to have a huge impact in the United States and potentially outside of it for a whole host of reasons, and that is the recent Supreme Court r- ruling which struck down Roe versus Wade on June 24th. And this is a bit of a controversial issue as you have a number of camps in terms of how people look at it, think about it, and the implications are massive. So to get an idea of potentially one viewpoint or a number of viewpoints, I have a Gen X couple on today who have a decent amount of insight across a number of uh, spectrums that this ruling being abolished may have. So it's great to have you guys on today. I'm looking forward to your insights. And I always find it interesting when you talk to different uh, generations and just different people from different walks of life, just how it, their perspective and, you know, everyone's viewpoint matters. And it's interesting to see how they go towards an issue as big as this. It's great to be on, Sean. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Perfect. So, you know, to begin with, we all know it happened last Thursday, June 24th, when it was struck, it was struck down. And I know there had been a lot of discussion about it, but I know a lot of people didn't think they would actually go through with it. And when they did, I will say it was quite a shock for me. And I, I was glued to the news for the remainder of that day, kind of like, what, what, what happened? And a lot of people I know were basically in a state of shock or a number of other emotions, depending on their viewpoints. But um, I guess just to begin with, what were your, what were your initial reactions and thoughts when uh, you heard about it? Well, for me, it was shock, to be honest with you. I, I honestly never thought that we would see that day. And especially after the recent um, confirmations in which um, those individuals stated that it was established law. Um, and then to now go and do this, you know, uh, it, it's pretty clear that they were somewhat deceptive in their responses during their confirmation hearings. Um, but yeah, shocked that we would go back to, you know, where we were 60 years ago. Um, the idea that banning abortion will eliminate abortion um, is ignorant. It's not going to happen. Women are going to die. It is still going to happen. Unfortunately, they're going to be trying to do it themselves. Um, but at the same time, you know, what is so frustrating, at least for me, in my opinion, is that the same individuals that are very happy that Roe v. Wade has been overturned, um, you know, are not familiar with, with the service, other services that have been provided, nor do they want to look at what could prevent abortion. So, you know, no, no one is pro-abortion that I know. Um, I am pro-choice. I've never had an abortion myself. I've had friends that have had abortions that I've accompanied. I've also volunteered for Planned Parenthood. Um, and, you know, if we want to stop abortion, then let's offer free and affordable birth control, health care. You know, let's make it available. Let's teach it to um, young women. Let's provide them with the resources they need so that we don't find ourselves in this situation. But the individuals that seem to be supporting the ban on abortion also don't want those services. They want to close down Planned Parenthood. Um, Planned Parenthood provides many more services than um, abortion services. And I can tell you, um, having been with friends at Planned Parenthood before, it's the very last option they offer. And they will not perform it, you know, on, you know, when you're there, basically it's, you have to go home and you have to think about it. So it's not something that just readily happens when somebody walks into Planned Parenthood. But the other services that people don't understand that Planned Parenthood provide are also prenatal services. When I was pregnant with Chris, um, I went to Planned Parenthood for my initial pregnancy test and for $2,700, they took me all the way through my pregnancy, hospitalization, and delivery. $2,700, $2,000. $2, 
Now, I ended up having to have an emergency C-section, so my insurance kicked in. But at that time, it wasn't mandatory for insurance companies to provide those services. I had employment insurance, and it wasn't mandatory for them to provide prenatal care. Um, so Planned Parenthood also does that in addition to, you know, providing free and affordable health care to women. So if people really want to solve the issue, then we need to look at solving the reason behind the issue and not just saying, oh, no, this is no longer available. And at the same time, um, you know, as a school psychologist, I'm evaluating four and five year olds in group homes because there aren't enough foster placements. These children are not being put in foster placement. So now what is going to happen is we're going to have many more children, unfortunately, that are going to be born into homes where maybe they're not wanted. Um, you know, there's abuse, there's neglect, there are a number of things. And, you know, yeah, I get, you know, every life should have a chance, but you're not giving them a chance by putting them in that environment and then going in and removing them and putting them in a group home or foster placement. You know, foster homes for the most part are good. Um, you know, I but the foster families I know have 11 and 12 kids there. So, you know, they're being over, you know, it's, it's, it's overrun. But then there's talk about, mon, you know, monetary, you know, increasing the money for it then you're not going to have good foster families. You're going to have people that are in it for the money. So I think that it's very short-sighted to just overturn Roe v. Wade, take all of these other things away. You know, it's almost like we're just perpetuating the problem and we're not going to go back to 1950s America. It's just not going to happen. So, you know, basically what they've done is, is they've created this huge um, issue. And, that, and, and a lot of people are going to die. So, yeah, yeah. I have some really good points in that anytime you make legislation on a, such a, a, a wide ranging and wide, in, widely affecting issue, you have to look at it holistically. And there are so many factors. And yeah, it, whenever there's a problem, yeah, sometimes you need to treat the, the, the byproducts or the direct effects. But in order to solve it, you have to go back to the root. You have, right. to address, you, know, you have to address it in that capacity. And what they're doing is not going to do that. It's just going to perpetuate a lot of previous problems because abortions have been happening as long as the, I would say, the ability for women to do it have been doing it. So mm-hmm. it's not going to solve it or anything by banning it. It's just like with drugs or other things. People are still going to do it. Well, and there are going to be more children that are born addicted Um, And then, you know, the flip side of that, and this could be a discussion for another time, perhaps, but as a school psychologist, watching all of these school shootings, apparently it's okay for us to continue to buy and sell these guns that are going into classrooms with children that are already living. And it's okay to slaughter them, but we're concerned with the cells that have the potential to become a baby, you know, but then also they've, they've, there's no common sense behind it. So a 12 year old is raped by her father and becomes pregnant. She's going to carry that baby to term. A woman is raped. She's going to be, she's going to carry that baby to term. A fetus will not live outside of the womb, maybe for 24 hours after the child is born, going to have to carry that child to term. So it, it's to me, it's it's there's a lot of it um, that just does not. It just doesn't make sense. I don't understand. The, That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, I mean, literally, that doesn't make sense. And just from a perspective, thinking about ha- as a woman having to do that, you know, especially with the circumstances of that happening, and that's just un- unfathomable, even as a man thinking about it, at least personally. So, you know, as somebody who is over the age of childbearing years. Um, you know, just to think about the implications for young women that I did not have to go through or worry about. And now, you know, these young women are going to have to be worrying about it. And it's, you know, ultimately, you know, it's on their shoulders, you know, as much as we want to say, well, you know, the man has responsibility too. Yeah, absolutely. But you know what, ultimately, it's on our shoulders. Mm -hmm. So, 
Yeah, Sean, I, the, my initial response was, I have to say, honestly, I, that I was not surprised based on the information that was leaked months ago or whenever it was, was leaked. Um, certainly disappointed in the same way that Faye had, Faith had mentioned about the Supreme Court justices that are now in place that were being confirmed previously in the Trump administration, I felt that they were deceptive. I felt that they went against, from a certain perspective, their oath during those confirmations. They stated pretty clearly the established precedent that Faith had talk, talked about earlier. Understandably, people change their minds, but I just don't buy it. I don't, I, I think they had already planned to do this because this movement and agenda has been going on for a long time. Ever since Roe versus uh, Roe v. Wade was put into place back in the early 70s, 72 or 73, um, there's been a movement to revoke it. And within the recent political climate, situation has become where number one, it's not the majority of the, of the opinion in the United States. It's not. So that's a great one, point because all, would, the, all the polls and the information that's coming out is the majority of people are definitely against this. I mean, it's not like 90-10, but it's substantially. Yeah, yeah it's, in the, it's in the mid to mid 60 percentile, something like that. There are a couple of polls are different, obviously. But the, the bottom line is that these folks in the political climate has allowed for the minority, mm -hmm. primarily driven by the Republican Party, it's just observably correct, to place people into power that don't represent the majority. And these folks, I think, were placed there. Gorsuch, uh, the, the lady, I don't remember her name. And then the other, the other guy who cried or whatever he did, you know, or got really upset because, because they challenged him. Poor guy. Um, well, he, well, we know he's a liar now. Yeah, so. well, see, that's the thing. So you <laughs> yeah, could argue. He's definitely they, a liar. So Ford was right. <laughs> you, could, you could argue that they lied under oath. Yeah, I mean, you could argue that. Not that you could prove it, but you could argue it. So I think this is a part of an ongoing agenda that's been going on ever since Roe v. Wade went into place. And it, for me, represents the legislation of morality, not of ordered society. You don't kill people without accountability. Ordered society is one thing. It's, quote, civilized. But this is not that. This is a legislation of morality from a more Abrahamic religious perspective which doesn't represent, regardless of your religious views, I respect that, but does not represent the progressive nature of change in the United States. Well, and so they've lost credibility. And I think that's been spread across a lot of different news and medias and things like that is they have lost a lot of credibility because they're supposed to be the voice of reason, the things that keep our ordered society balanced. That this decision is not, in my humble opinion, representative of that. Well, and this was a Supreme Court that felt mandating masks was yes. unconstitutional. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's not okay to say you gotta wear a mask or get a vaccine, but it's okay to tell a woman what she can and can't do with her body. Yeah, that's that's a that's a kind that's I think you could argue that's an oxymoron. And they've actually shown tape of a lot of these Republican mouthpieces talking about that COVID situation and no mask, and then talking about the abortion issue, playing right next to each other. And it's obviously a contradiction. Mm -hmm. Any sensible, reasonable person is going to make that determination. Yeah, that's, I mean, no, I mean, you definitely bring up some good points. And yeah, there's a lot of contradictions. And it's just, I think, I think even though it's been, it's been over a week now, but I think everyone's still in a state of shock, either, even if it was expected or unexpected, but I think it's really opened a lot of, a lot of doors. And I think opened a lot, a big can of worms, because look at all the protests that are going on. Yeah. I think Thank goodness. One thing that it really has accomplished is that it's really, for, you can say it's woken up a lot of the younger population. Yeah, it's galvanized. Yes. I hope so. And I hope they vote. 
That's yes, what they yeah, need exactly. To they, vote. You know, people need to vote. I mean, I sometimes meet people who don't vote, and I'm like, you gotta. It's like that's you know, go vote. That's what you're supposed to do. Oh, it won't matter. Yes, it does. I, it you know really. I mean, I get Bernie Sanders didn't get the nomination, but really, you're going to sit home and not vote because you. Know, why? So then we get Donald Trump for four years. And then, and yeah, here we are. This is where we find ourselves. So, you know, and on the, at the same time, we've got a lot of state elections going on where, mm-hmm. you know, we've got folks that are being put into office that are fine with, you know, overturning an election. So. And, that, and that's a little yeah. concerning. And yeah, the Illinois pri- general primary was just uh, this past Tuesday. Yeah. And so, yeah, they need to vote. That's the, what they need to do. These people in, that are making or in these positions of power, they're making these decisions. They're reasoning in terms of logical fallacies and all the different things that associate a clear, free thinking, open minded person are horridly flawed. Horridly flawed. You line up their explanations for this. Again, it comes back to this kind of brainless mismatch of. Abrahamic religious tradition, which even in a lot of historical perspectives, they don't understand themselves. So it's like they're in a position to make decisions that are not of the majority, that are not reasonable, that don't support a ordered progressive society. And I think, as you said, it's waking up and galvanizing the younger part, the younger part of the United States, which is not like that. They are progressive. Mm-hmm. interracial um, relationships, all different things that these folks champion. And, you know, you're a part of that generation. Yeah. I mean, and, to, yeah. Like, you know, boomers to Z to millennials, or sorry, boomers to X to, to millennials. And yeah. then Z, you can see yeah. progression. And, you know, of course, they need to stand up and kick these people out of office by voting mm-hmm. so that we can continue on a progressive a progressive direction in this country, which every time we have done that, amazingly positive things have happened. Exactly. We, it's all about maintaining when balance. This, when we do things like this or allow it to happen, yes, it galvanized. So you could say that it, 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 it has hopefully a long-term positive effect because we'll wake up as a company, a country and recognize that the silent majority is against this. Yeah. And it's really, as I said, the time for our younger generation to stand up and get these guys out of here. They don't represent the direction that the, that the country is going in, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yep. Exactly. And I think that they would say that if you if you polled them, I think they, they would say that. No, I, I, I would agree. I think a large number certainly would. And that kind of leads into the next and the next point I want to bring up is the short term implications, because. We're in a bit of a state of flux right now where people are like, what's going on? And, you know, and this kind of could break down across social, economic, legal, and political, you know, realms. I know, like, socially, it's caused a lot of panic and uh, concern. Mm-hmm. Interesting, I was looking at the number of, of men and women looking into, like, getting uh, sterilization or, like, vasectomies or getting their tubes tied has increased. Like, I think mm-hmm. very alone, it was almost one clinic said they're in vasectomy inquiries increased 900 percent wow know that yeah economic on the economic side like you were saying the impact on the foster care system social services all this all these things that's you know not going to be immediately but that's going to build up and short term you'll see it long term you'll definitely see it yeah for in terms of rights i mean for both for men and women, but especially women. I mean, this is a huge thing because now I think the United States is the, only the four of all the developed countries, one of four that doesn't have, you know, abortion protected or it's accessible across the board in those countries, in, which is like, what? And then lastly, political. This has open, opened up a lot of potential for other things that we take for granted or we think yeah. are general yeah. law or, you know, protected by the judicial system in the United States. To potentially be either be altered or even removed entirely. That's right. Observably, the folks that are again making these decisions that are not representative of the majority, they are they are mostly men. They are mostly men. A lot of times they're older men. So if you want to use the Supreme Court as an example of the of the majority, which I don't think that in this particular ruling, the Chief Justice. He was a dissenter, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure about that. But 
it was one, two, three, three men, the conservatives, maybe four, if you include the Lido, and then the lady who is a staunch Catholic. Again, not to, to be right Catholics, because I think there's a number of Catholics now that actually are pro-choice in that particular sense. But that being said, this is part of the issue. Men are making this, these decisions and for the wrong, logically phallicidic reasons. Well, and there should be women that are more involved in this. Well, and they're very detached. Yes. So I think it's very to, you know, be where they are and, and make these decisions when they're not seeing the children in the group. They're not seeing, you know, children abandoned. They're not seeing these things happen. Um, and so it's very easy to become detached. You know, and isn't it easy to say that, you know, you should not have this procedure? Um, even though it was a legal procedure, you should not have this procedure. But again, you know, no, 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 no plan as to what you're going to do after. Um, years ago, back in the 80s, there was an organization called, I believe, Operation Rescue, if I recall correctly. Um, and they would actually come to clinic parenthoods and they would lay down on the sidewalks and they would, you know, harass women going into Planned Parenthood. Um, and, you know, the individual who was the leader of this organization, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but um, they asked him one time in an interview, okay, so you prevented the abortion. What now? What about the child? What are you going to do now to help the child? And he said, it's not my problem. I prevented the abortion. That's it. And so I think for many of these people, isn't it easy to do that? But, you know, there's no thought for after effect and what's going to happen and the outcome of these children. And so, you know, um, programs are being removed that are going to support these children. You know, um, public education is being cut. Um, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of, you know, issues. You know, I mean, with one of the things that all districts do across the nation, um, when a child turns three, we are responsible for evaluating and, if applicable, identifying a child with a disability and then providing services. Um, and so, you know, with the cuts in education and the things that we're doing, you know, it, it, it's, it's very difficult. But there's just not a lot of thought given to, okay, you've done this now, what next? Yeah, yeah. and then, and also, in, especially on the legal side, you can see in states that have these you know, the trigger laws where they've triggered now that Roe is yeah. not, not there anymore. And then, so there's that, that's a huge impact. But what's interesting, I think it's in, I think, uh, several states now, I think, including Kentucky, they, are, they have been temporarily blocked by the state court, yeah. so which has bought some time. But what's scary about it is that, like, you know, for example, where I'm at in Illinois, it's potentially this will be the only state that has made, will maintain the status quo. And, and I think Governor Pritzker even said they're expecting, you know, 20 to 30,000 more women a year crossing Illinois if, if, it, if everything unfolds the way they potentially think they will be to come to, come to Illinois for abortion, for abortion care or similar types of, types of care. And, but also, you know, from doing some research for this episode, a lot of the states that have that, they have the higher, higher rates of, of, of um, child abuse less social services, less safety nets. And yep. it's like, it's kind of contradictory that in many cases, it's like, now if they, if some people come out and they say, we want to fund this and build these, that's great. Okay. Okay. That's at least something, but okay. Now let's, how, now let's, how, how do you plan to do it? If you have a plan, great, but I'm not seeing a lot of that. I mean, granted, I, we don't know everything, but it's just kind of a ironic to put, put, to put it just bluntly. <laughs> You know, it's, it's the prenatal care for the mother. Some of these women are going to be kicked out of their home once, you know, or, you know, one thing that I see quite a bit of grandparents are raising these kids, you know, so it just, you know, I, it, it there's just not, it, it seems like, you know, not only have we done away with what could help, you know, we're, we're just making the problem worse. So. Yeah, I think. I think also at the heart of this, there's a lot of connective tissue here. You brought up a lot of good things that we could have many, many, many hours of discussion on. We can all recognize that. But there's also the essential right to choose regarding your personhood, your body, 
your life, your happiness, live the dream. In this, they've kind of taken away a certain amount of women's living the dream here in terms of their choice of what they do with their bodies, which is an intimate part of someone's personal experience of life. So again, connected to this legislation of morality, which is not necessary in an organ or in an ordered society of law. Well, the rest of the but when you think about it, this is about individual choice. Not my individual choice to shoot somebody with a gun, but some but a decision about my particular body and more particularly, you know, for for a for women. Well, and I felt after that happened, I was went to the store like I do normally. I felt I needed to apologize to the people that I saw. That's how I felt as a man. But No, it, it's just, it's very frustrating. Um, I yeah, I mean, just, you know, from my perspective, trying to look at it in a broad sense, I mean, it's frustrating, for, it's frustrating, and it, it's just like, in a way, unimaginable, and that's coming from, you know, be, me being a male, but imagining like a female, I, I, it's like, oh, my God. A lot of these same people that are, you know, for banning abortion, what, if the government made COVID vaccines mandatory, they would be the first ones up there saying, you know, they wouldn't even wear a mask. They said that was against their rights. You can't tell them to wear a mask. Now, if you made COVID or vaccines, to own a gun. you know, yeah. Or, you know, let's take these guns that are actually killing the kids that are here, you know, um, and, but no, nope, because you know what? They don't agree with that because they don't agree with that. Then that's not going to be okay. I was at school a few weeks ago. Again, it was summer. I was doing these evaluations and I, I went to the restroom, right? And my office is in a separate building. Um, I went out and I propped the door open and I caught myself and I stopped and I said, Nope, you can't prop the door open. And I thought about the most recent school shooting. Um, and that's, that's sad. That's sad. But that is not a main concern. Those guns are still available because that's their constitutional right. Yeah. You know, there, yeah, there was I, a, yeah. I can't have the USS Missouri in my swimming pool. You know, there's an element of common sense there. So, you know, why we need to have these available whenever they're slaughtering our children does not make sense to me. But let's outlaw abortion <laughs> yeah that, so. i heard something about well guns are in the constitution abortion isn't so you can break that down historically give a musket yes yeah okay you have a right to a musket number one and number two science for abortion hadn't been developed but it still has to do with life liberty and the pursuit of happiness all those things are tied to personal choice a pro-life person may say well life 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 well we can get into a bait about when life begins. That's not necessarily, it's kind of beyond the scope of some of the things that we're talking about here. But ultimately, as Faye said earlier, is it a difference between a clump of cell, cells that has potential or is it really about taking care of the American dream? Like people alive, liberty and the pursuits of happiness. That, does, that's, that seems to be the most ironic contradiction in this situation. That's the exact word I was thinking of. It's just goes, heavily contradictory. Goes right away from women, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Well, and I just no go back. incest, no rape of things. Okay, you have a stillborn child. Imagine the mental and emotional trauma that will cause to the mother. But apparently, that's the that's the morality that they want to legislate. But don't make me wear a mask. So, you know, it's, it's, it is the height of hypocrisy because, you know, they themselves don't want to be told what they have to do, i.e., you know, you have to get a vaccine, you have to wear a mask, but have no problem telling a woman, you know, what she, she can do and not do with her body that is quite an intimate decision. I mean, that's, yep. you know, I've never known anyone to have an abortion that it did not emotionally impact them. Yep. You know, we don't give out gift certificates for abortions at Christmas. You know what I mean? We take it very seriously. And so, you know, I've never met anyone that did not have um, trauma 
you know, stemming from it. And, um, you know, so I, I just, you know, there's no solution, basically. It's like, we're just going to take away, take away, take away, take away. And we're not going to provide any solution because we're just going to take it away. And I don't, you know, it's just stupid. So. Yeah. Yeah. Prevention is always the best cure in a general sense. Yeah. You prevent disease. You prevent unwanted pregnancy. You prevent um, <clears throat> a variety of different things. I was very lucky in the 80s because I was able to go to Planned Parenthood without my parents' permission. I want to say I was probably 15 or 16. I was able to go and get free birth control. And um, I didn't have to have my parents' permission. Anything they sent to my house came in an unmarked envelope. Now, you know, my dad did open it one time. And <laughs> he found out. But he also told me he was very proud of me that I was taking responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it, when it's available and when we're teaching our children, then that's when we're going to see a decrease, not by yeah. just saying, nope, it's not going to happen. And the same folks who are in this movement, you know, to remove Roe v. Wade, they're not into funding mm -hmm. sex education in schools. No. Again, because of this connection to this legislation of morality that is not progressive. It's not about necessarily imposing any particular thing on anyone else because we have freedom of and from religion in this country. It's in the constitution, just like the guns. What they're doing yeah. is the opposite of that. They're legislating morality from that Abrahamic religious tradition. And I actually worked with a woman years ago. Actually, when I was in high school, I, I hostessed at a restaurant there in uh, Clayton. And she that was a conversation. She did not know how she had gotten pregnant the first time. So nobody had told her. And so she was quite a bit, you know, she was probably four or five months along before she realized she had no idea how a baby was made. That's just very sad to hear. It, it is very sad. And so, but, you know, at the same time, a lot of these people are not having those frank conversations with, with their children. You know, I mean, if we're hearkening back to 1950, you know, the puberty fairy come and hits you on the head with her magic wand. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's those conversations are not being had. And so I just, you know. Well, and yeah. it goes back to education. It's like, you know, yeah. only being taught it doesn't work. You know, it's like it just we're humans. It's not going to work. I mean, you know, right. and yeah, prevention, education, and parenting is yes. important. And I just yes. find more and more that lack of parenting and, oh, that's taboo. We can't talk about that. Well, actually it's really important. Well, it's like, if you have kids, I think personally you need to talk about, you know, you know, sex ed, money, yes. morality, and, you know, other social and moral things that will impact your, you know, the child's life. Nothing should be off the table. Now, of course, there's times and places to do that, but it shouldn't be, oh, we can't talk about that. At least from a general perspective, respecting people's religious traditions or philosophical yeah. traditions, notwithstanding, you know, but they're from a general sense of an ordered society. This is the direction the country wants to go in is representative of the people that are in the majority. What they're doing is not that cannot be overstated and overemphasized. So as I said earlier, their credibility as a moderating factor to the legislative and executive branch has been seriously eroded. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, you know, before this decision um, and when Trump was in office, I'm not a Donald Trump fan. Um, whenever he was in office, I thought, wow, but we've got the Supreme Court. You know, we've got the Supreme Court. So that's, you know, we've got checks and balances. That is supposed to be a balancing factor. And I don't believe that anymore. Yeah. Politically, this, as I said at the beginning of this, this has been a setup. Mitch McConnell, in my opinion, pushed this, did not allow the last um, Supreme Court appointment during the Obama administration, mm -hmm. which was absolute BS. That was his right to do. But they came up with some BS reasons not to do it. And they've been loading courts with conservative judges for political reasons, not in the best interest of the majority of the progressive nature of the United States and how it's developing. And that, I think, is the biggest shame and disappointment from my perspective.
That it does not represent, in my opinion, the direction of our progressive society. But because it means that their vision of their own sense of power, either in small groups or individually, is somehow going to be eroded if they don't do this. I'm not going to act in the best interest of the country. I'm just going to act in terms of saving my own sense of power. Yes. Yeah, and, and I think that goes back to the, prem, the premise of kind of a lot of the short-term impacts is that in the short term, it's caused a lot of lack, you know, eroding or, you know, just a huge amount of now distrust. In, yes. Well, okay. All right. This is, you know, I'm a voter. I do this, but, oh, they're not going to follow. Or there's like, oh, they're not going to serve interest. They're going to do what they want. They don't care about the masses or the majority of what people want. And yeah. their vote. And it's not my interpretation what the founding fathers wanted to do. Well, nice so we need to expand the su Supreme Court. I agree. Yeah. They need to expand the number of judges, which they can do. So hopefully that political will to do it because that'll balance things out again. Because yeah. unfortunately it's become politicized for the wrong reasons. Right. And I agree. And I mean, you know, Arizona case in point, I want to say the law that they're falling back on is like 120 years old. <laughs> so, you know. A little um, antiquated. Yeah, so, okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I think, you know, in the overall, in the short term, this is going to cause confusion and fear. Okay. It already had. Well, right. they've also written the law so vaguely in many states that it, you know, they did so in order, to, I think, to cause fear in doctors. So, you know, they're very vague. So they can they can be interpreted yeah. in a variety of ways, um, which then, yeah, I mean, the doctors are like, hey, I don't want to do this. I don't want to get in trouble because I don't know what this means. What did we see? What did they have to do? Uh, those uh, um, menstruation or period apps. Yeah, when because of the data, them. they're yeah. saying that the, the experts, the IT folks are saying to delete those because they could potentially, the data could be potentially, it's not protected by HIPAA, apparently, and it could be used against people in legal cases where they can prove that they did have an abortion. So women are starting to delete things that actually are helpful for them with their own personal hygiene and health care. That's just unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, we've we've definitely regressed as a nation. I, I you know, just in collectively, I definitely think that yes, this has been a, a large regression, especially in terms of human rights and women's rights, and also just the ability, confidence, and I'd say, you know, decision making of the family unit now. Because yeah. It's, a, yeah. it's going to affect how people are going to think about how, how they're going to think about raising a family. This might dissuade a lot of people from having kids or it's going to trap a lot of people, into, you know, having to raise kids when they're not ready. And of course, you know, yeah. And accidents happen. Hmm, you can do all the stuff, right. But accidents happen yep. things like that. So it's like, it's not practical when you look at it from the big picture. Yeah. Yes. No. It's not practical. It's impractical. Exactly. And then, and then kind of, and, people are going to lose their lives as a result of the real tragedy. And then, kids, yeah, after they're born, if they're even born alive. Yeah. Yeah. And then kind of, and then from going from there, we can move into more of the long-term implications, which I think the short term, it's more, it's kind of a maelstrom right now, but long-term, I think they're even more severe and clear cut mm -hmm. among the same key areas that, we, that we've already highlighted. Socially, it's going to cause a lot of strain. Economically, it's going to cause a huge amount of strain. It's going to also test a lot of legality issues. And also, I think it's going to create a lot of fights and issues from, between states. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because yep. if one state says, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, but the state next door says, oh, it's fine. And they try to say that, the state's going to be like, no, we're not going to help you with that. I'm just, you know, hypothetically speaking, that's what yep. And then, of course, politics, it's going to make things more murky and create more division that's the key it, they, this move has created an even further divide between certain parts of the united states in terms of the examples of states that have those trigger laws that you mentioned earlier which just well, said literally so, yeah if you look at the, look at a map now you basically have the coasts and yep. the core the core is basically in break more or less embracing this with some exceptions and the coastal area in the coastal areas more progressive more yeah. progressive and yeah. so and that's that has big social social economic social and also and also economic implications 
Yep. Now, it also could set a lot of ish, a lot of problems in the future when mm-hmm. the country yep. starts to divide too rapidly in terms of yep. all these spectrums. Well, and and also, you know, you we are going to have a generation, if not longer, of kiddos and adults that have significant trauma. Mm-hmm. And again, you know, I, I don't think people making the laws fully understand that these children don't have a say until they're 18. So, you know, when you're a four-year-old and all you know is the environment that you're in, you don't know anything else. And then you have a stranger come and take you, even though you may have been in horrible conditions, that's all you have known. That's still mom and dad. So then they end up in a group home. And so then just the trauma that comes out of of that experience. And these kids are not in group homes for a few weeks. There are kids that are in group homes starting when they are five years old, all the way up until 18, you know, and, and, you know, I've, I've had kids more than once where they just didn't earn enough points. So they don't get their birthday party this year, you know? So it, it just, you know, the, the significant trauma, they have not done these kids any favors. You know, this whole idea that right to life, well, you, you know, you tell me how you're giving them a life. Especially because the evidence, the observable evidence is that they don't really care about these kids after they're born. There are plenty of credible information, um, empirical information about this actually being the case. Mm -hmm. Some states, as I think you mentioned it earlier. You know, the whole idea that, you know, certain states have the the most horrible law when it comes to taking care of of, of, ch- of unwanted children. So, again, an amazing contradiction and irony to this whole debate. And I can't tell you how many children that I've worked with that, you know, come in to talk as a psychologist Um all of this trauma and the idea then that they have these case managers and that kind of thing. Many of the kids that I work with don't even know who their case managers are. And I can tell you from experience, it's quite typical to have four or five case managers within uh, two or three months. And I can't even keep track of them. A lot of times I can't even get calls back a lot of times. point. You know, and, and yeah, I mean, here in Arizona, I mean, the ideal caseload would be, you know, maybe you got 50 kids, but because there are so many kids currently in the system, these case managers that, and I'm talking about the state, um, case managers that are overseeing these children that have been removed from their home, we're talking about two and 300 caseloads. So they can't get to these kids. That's where we're at right now. There's too, so, much, there's too, too many, too, ma- too many children for too few case managers to effectively manage and assist in the way they need it. So yeah, I mean, yeah. So basically, yeah, if you're gonna do this and you, boot and you beef up all the services and everything, okay, that's something. But if you're not, then it's you're just gonna make a problem ten times worse. What we're gonna end up with, and I and I hate to say this, and I hope I'm wrong, but you know, back in in the late '80s, early '90s, we went through a deinstitutionalization um, for individuals with disabilities, taking them out of nursing homes and that kind of thing. I think now we're going to see a new institutionalization. I think that, you know, the four and five kid in the group home, that's going to go away. We're going to need 30, 40. You know, it's going to be the same thing. This is our new, you know, institutionalization. These children that are coming out of these homes and we're going to have a generation of trauma. Yeah. You know, and I, and I think, you know, all these factors are going to pile up and, you know, especially you working with, you know, with, with, you know, psych- psychologically helping children and working with children on the school setting, you have a great viewpoint of just what the issues are now and how this could magnify 10, 100 fold with, you know, right. But yeah. would, do you think any one of these issues is going to be bigger or do you think it's going to be a, a kind of universal, universal across these main issues we've discussed in terms of. I, I, I think it's going to be somewhat universal. I think you're going to have um, a number of, young women that don't have the health care that they need. Um, I think as a result, you're going to see issues there, um, issues with, you know, prenatal care, you know, probably not going to be getting prenatal care. I think we're going to see more um, babies that um, come into this world with addiction. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I just think, you know, these are 
These are kids that aren't wanted. Let's just be frank about it. These are kids that aren't wanted, you know? And so are we probably going to have some psychological resentment towards that child because you've had that child? Yeah, probably. How's that going to come out towards that child? You resent that child. Abuse, whether it's emotional, whether it's physical or both, abuse. And then we just have these children going into the system and are messed up. So um, the, I, I just think the long-term ramifications of this are brutal, you know, um, and, and it's, it's brutal to the women and, and it's brutal to the children. Yeah. So uh, to me, just where I'm from, where I'm sitting at and what I observe, um, I think that, you know, I, I just can't even imagine adding to that trauma. And now we've added it. Yep. A hundredfold. Yeah. And consider from a historical perspective, um, what was the singular issue be behind the original American Civil War? Slavery. It is arguably possible that something of what we're talking about now could be a linchpin to something similar. History as a way of repeating itself. You mentioned earlier about creating more division. They created more division, the coasts, the Midwest, you know, is it? And it's Abraham Lincoln, so eloquent house divided cannot stand. Things get too divided. Something has to bring things back into balance. And that could be correct. And that could not be a pretty thing. In 2022, with all the progressive elements and things the United States has led the world, not necessarily the best anymore. There's some kind of clip on YouTube with, uh, I think, Jeff Daniels, where some high school students naively talk, oh, we got this, this, and this. Actually, no, we don't. And a lot of the reasons why, in my opinion, that is the case is exactly what Scottis did. It's things and actions like that at the governmental level that create and take away the vision <coughs> of the American dream well, and, and its then, representation to the rest of the world. And then even just our legislators now that um, too. with, with continuing to perpetuate the big lie when yeah. it's quite obvious that, you know, oh, yeah, involved in the election. Yes. You yeah, know, that's a whole um, thing. so, you know, continuing, we no longer have, you know, I mean, I'm a Democrat, but I can tell you, um, I was an independent for many years. And even though I typically would vote Democrat, anytime John McCain was on the ticket here in Arizona, I voted for him <laughs> because I felt like John McCain, I, I didn't feel like it was political with him, right? I felt like he cared. When he came out and did that health care, thumbs down, that was for my son with type one diabetes. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So, you know, those, those folks are gone. You know, so it's I, it is no longer about what is truly right for people. It is about what is going to get me elected and what base can I, um, you know, play to so that I yep. can get elected. Oh, yeah, so public service is no longer about service. It's it's a way to gain, you know, you know, career, advancement, yeah. career, career, power, money, other things. And, yeah. you know, statesmen like John McCain and many others in the past. They were true statesmen in that capacity, yeah. regardless of party, and they could and they could reach across the aisle and work together, you know, yeah. on any issues. Yeah, of course, not everything, but now it's like it's my way or the highway is. It seems like the big thing with 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 many on both sides. Yeah. Well, and they're right. very they're very. I I mean, the idea that they are perpetuating this lie to for to be you know it's advantageous to them to get the votes, but it's like. It's, it's a lie. And the, the, you know, the evidence is pretty obvious. And so it's, it's, I, I'm. Yeah. It's I, something that's been invalidated and a little research can pretty much guarantee that opinion. If you use logic and put your, put any biases aside, which is difficult, but yeah, but the, the fact that it's being perpetuated and how this issue with abortion and all these other things are kind of co-mixing right now in, in many ways. There's a, it's more than one issue. It's all these issues percolating right now, which are just right. causing a huge right. amount of uncertainty, which is just, you know, it's just, it's in many ways, it's quite terrifying. Right. It's yeah. grossly amplified, yeah. Yeah. you know, for political purposes. And I don't know that we've ever been in such polarized society before. 
Yeah, maybe, maybe again, back to the idea of the Civil War and slavery. But there's another thing, too, you know, they, the, the announcement of Roe v. Wade being overturned comes at a time when the January 6th hearings are going on. I can't help but wonder. Coincidence. Actually time to take people's attention away from. That's not the first time I've heard that. And it's another very important situation about the integrity and longevity of American democracy. Which again, American democracy championing life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, which ultimately comes down to the idea of choice. Not if you're a woman, it doesn't. But that's the point. It should. And that's why I'm saying that even though they say abortion is not in the Constitution, that's an example of it being inherently in the Constitution. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it hasn't been, you know, I mean, 100 years isn't that long, you know, that we've had the vote. And so, you know, the idea that these rights are slowly being stripped away, um, I just don't think we can get complacent with it. I think that we have to make sure that we continue to be vocal because, yes. you know, if, if they then go uh, uh, for birth control next, which Clarence Thomas wrote, they've already stated um, their agenda. you know, so if they're going after birth control next and then what, what is next? I mean, what is next? So, you know, I just, I just, I, I just don't know what to make of it. I just never thought in my lifetime that I would live to see this day. And ironically, Judge Thomas, it's not probably going to go after interracial marriage. Because, I mean, guess what? because his wife is, is white. Another example of contradictive logical fallacy. Well, to go after individuals in same sex marriages or even yeah. some discussion about what you do in your bedroom. And this just harkens back to 1950s, you know, our or earlier. earlier. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, it just, laws, all that kind of I, I just never thought I would live to see the day when this happened and, and just the regression of America. I'm almost ashamed. And this is horrible yeah. to say, and I'm sure there are people that might be listening to your podcast that say, well, move someplace else. I'm almost ashamed to say I'm an American now. In some respects, in some, but that for me, it only means that it gives us the opportunity. It gives us an opportunity turn this around into a positive kind of perspective. Yeah. It gives a lot of people, young generation we talked about, an opportunity to stand up and get rid of these people yeah, they need who to are standing in the way. Exactly. Just look at the demographics in politics right now. I mean, yeah. Both parties. <laughs> they're yeah. not, they're not, millenn- they're not, you know, not, not even a lot of Gen Xers, Gen, you know, millennials. Yeah. They're boomers, you know, primarily. And yeah, yeah. I think this is like like we've already discussed. This is going to wake up a lot of younger Americans, and I really hope so. Well, I, didn't think, I mean that you know, just with the recent election and what's coming out in the January sixth committee, you know, there are people that are going into state positions that would have been for false electors, would have yes. been for overturning yep. Yep. a just election. There yep. are people that do not believe in the are. United States of America and a democracy. There, there are people that do not want us to, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, yes. it's just, if they're prepared to do that, they're prepared to forego this little experiment yep. that we've been doing, yep. you know, since the 1700s and, you know, go back to like imperial rule or yep. a monarchy or something. So, um, you know, and there are people who want that. And, and that is the other thing that, you know, young people need to be aware of. And another reason to vote, it's not just federal. You know, they've got State. to be aware. Oh, very important. Yeah. Yeah, because and, that's going to affect you more, even more directly because, yeah, yeah the federal is, is important, but who's your mayor? Who's your who's yep. county? Who's state? If we could have the wrong secretary of state during the 2020 election. In Arizona. Then the wrong person would have, I mean, we sent fake electors. Yeah. And luckily, out. the Secretary of State for Arizona was like, hey, hang on a minute. I'm not doing this. I took an oath. I'm not going to That was the, um, the Speaker yeah. of the House. Speaker of the House. Representative oh, yeah, Speaker Arizona. of the House. Yeah. I thought he was, but anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, Speaker of the House. But it's like, you know, okay, so if we start getting people in here that are like, oh, I believe the conspiracy and I'm going to promote it because it's good for me, um, 
we Personal are interest ahead of public and national interest. Yeah, yes. we are we are effed. You know what I'm saying? Yes. We are we are just in and a thank bad God that we had certain people in places where they were at when yes. that happened. And you know, yeah. and going back yeah. to this this we that needs to be the case with this to correct this in many cases or to try to find a way to get through this. Right. But yeah. if the wrong people are elected and people are just, you know, not voting, then we have no choice. It's going to happen. So the opportunity now, Sean, is also in the legislative branch um, to get the, the ability to, to legislate something like Roe v. Wade, you know, the, the Protection of Women's Act or whatever it was that failed in the Senate, and we know why. That needs to be a part of um, the ballot box in the midterms so that we can that that progressiveness from the standpoint of women's choice can be something that is an actual law. Yeah, something that's set in stone that's in fact life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Yeah, it's like our country doesn't care about us. They're like there's certainly there's certainly argument for that given what yeah. Happened. I don't think, I think that a lot of men that are in positions that are contributing to this issue and this problem, you know, this basically this abomination of a justice for the rights of women need to remember where they came from. They came out of a woman. There's a reason for that. And that needs to be respected at the highest levels. I like the, what's the song by, um, um, what's the artist that did the song about women's voting? Um, Lady oh, Gaga. Yeah. Where in that particular video, it, it shows the progressive younger legislators well, that actually shows, voted yeah. for that because against mother, the buddy daddies because who were standing mother, in the way. Because his mother. Yeah. Thank you. His because mother. his mother. Yeah. Because of his mom. Men come from women. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, it, it's just like, you know, it's like you think about the big picture and, yeah, it's just like, Sometimes it's like common sense, but as we know, common sense is not commonly found. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, no. Fortunately, no. So kind of, but it can be. Yeah, of course, of course. And then kind of the last, the last point I have for you both today is, you know, the general question is, you know, how it's going to affect you individually. I mean, we've covered all this, but on an individual level, like for me, you know, being a young, younger person. It's definitely making me think about a lot of things, you know, but you started family, you know, my girlfriend and I, how are we going to, you know, luckily we're still in a state where it's not really had an impact, but potentially could in the future. It's making me think very deeply about a lot of potential things and the ramifications of it. I think for, for me anyway, um, it, it's, it's thinking about you guys and, and <laughs> the people that I care about and the people that I love and watching the impact um, you know, so for me, at, you know, not being of that age anymore, the, the, that particular issue is not touching me, but it could very well touch people that I care about yeah. that I love. Um, but you know, for me personally, I don't know how far it's going to go, you know? So, I mean, like I said, what are they going to take away next? And so, um, maybe, <laughs> Maybe, you know, when I hit 65, I don't deserve that cancer treatment because I'm just a woman, you know? So I, I just, I don't know where, I just don't know where it ends. Where does it end? Exactly. And that's what's, what, what is, you know, I think horrific and d d deeply, deeply, deeply concerning is just not knowing what else can happen in the near future regarding legislation, previous th established norms that we all take for granted. And that goes back to the larger point is that, in a democracy, you can't take for granted everything. You have to be active. And as a member right. of the democratic state like the United States, you have to be an individual. You have to pay attention. You have to look and vote in your interests. And a lot of young people I know don't do that. And I'm not, I'm not trying to call them out or anything. It's just that, oh, well, what are a lot of people interested? Oh, reality TV, celebrities, all this stuff. It's like, okay, that's great. But that's not going to have any impact on you. Uh, you know, if it does, it's, it's minuscule. We've become very comfortable. So the assumption there Place, is, yes. oh, it's going to be fine. Oh, somebody else is going to vote. Oh, it's going to no. be fine. And I think where we're getting is to the point to where, yeah, no, it's not going to be fine. Yeah. And, um, you, you, you know, we've always, I think we've gotten very comfortable with living in the United States and, you know, that's ah, going to be okay, you know. Uh, 
and it's not. Yeah. The, the being okay is not. So. I, I would agree. You know, you have to, you know, and you have to pay attention and you have to look what's going on because especially if, you know, and I think because if you haven't been outside of the United States, that's one thing, but like, like for me, I've lived abroad and I've lived in, I live in places where you don't have a lot of those things. You get to see a little more of a different perspective. It makes you really appreciate these things. And I think a lot of Americans need to realize that because especially some later places in the world right now, you know, here, Oh, I don't like it. If you're if in some countries, yeah, if you say that you may not uh, be seen again, or, you know, other large scale ramifications. And we don't want to get, we don't want to get to a point where that becomes something here. Well, I think it, it also gives me an opportunity, you know, to, it's impressive upon people. We've talked about how important it is to vote and why. So enter, yeah, getting, why? To enter into conversations with people um, who are potentially influencers to the point where um, they can pass on that reasonability um, and sensibility to other folks that uh, you know are open to it because they're they have their own spheres of influence. I guess in terms of how it's affecting me, as I said in the very beginning, I feel ashamed. I feel ashamed personally. So any opportunity that I'm going to get, you know, in a social situation to be able to promote why it's important to vote, why it's important, you know, to protect life, liberty, and, and to happiness, the inculcation of arguably abortion rights or women's choice, women's health care, whatever it may be in the Constitution, then I'm going to do it. And if that means that if we have an opportunity, Faith and I have talked about before, maybe there would be something where we can actually peacefully protest in a way that would um, support something like that if the opportunity came up. I'm not I'm definitely open to that. Yeah. You know, as, as citizens of the United States, we have those rights, you know, protest other things as long as it's done in a nonviolent format, which unfortunately has already been shown to happen previously. <laughs> You know, that's, you know, you need, if you want something and you believe in something, you have to take some action to do it. You can't just be complacent yeah. and not, yeah. oh, it'll, it'll, oh, someone else will do it, like we said, or, or it'll, it'll take yeah. taken care of you. We can't assume that. Unfortunately, I, you know, and I, I agree with that. I agree with that. It's just not working anymore. So we've got to vote them out. Yeah, we got to vote them out. I think, I'm not sure if it was Cicero or Marcus Aurelius who said something about, it was a quote. I can't remember exactly what it was. But it was basically talking about, you know, if you're, if you don't take action, you know, in terms of your conscience, you know, then you're going to end up being ruled by indigents, you know, or, uh, you know, people, you know, people who are immoral or whatever it may be. You have to be able to create that balance. I can't remember the quote, but um, yeah, you got to act. You got to do something. And it, voting is uh, big elections. Uh, critical <laughs> to get rid of these people yeah, state level federal level and expand the supreme court expand yeah. the supreme court specifically so that we have a more balanced fair and balanced now that it's become obviously politicized yes. away from the founding fathers architecture of what it's supposed to represent yeah i think for me that's been a big um unfortunate awakening because i did always look at the supreme court as the balance and uh yeah, I mean, look at past administrations and many things. They've always been kind of, you know, they may tilt back and forth, but they've always kind of kept the boat steady. And now that's been put completely into question. Yeah, not yeah, I don't feel I don't trust them anymore. The, yeah. the, the precepts, they may be learned judges, respect what they did to get there, but their precepts are based on, in my humble opinion, a lot of erroneous things, which goes down to what I mentioned earlier. About legislating morality. Yes. Grounded, <laughs> fortunately. Well, you know, I, you know, all great points and all things that I think we all, as citizens and you know, as humans, have to take into consideration, especially in the near, near to long term future, across all these spectrums that we've discussed. And you know, I think we brought up a lot of points of view and holistic thoughts about really the implications of this on a very law, large and widespread axis, you know, you know, in the future, short, whatever. And I think people need to listen. People need to be able to debate, and discuss. And it's gotten to the point where people are like, oh, you don't believe me? Oh, shut up, get out of my face. Things like that. Like, no, no, let's talk and learn. Because if someone doesn't agree with me, I'm curious to see what they had to say. 
may they have some they have some points and good things and vice versa I can provide to them. But the point is to be to be able to communicate and be able to reason together, which we're seeing. Yeah. And that's yeah. and that's and that's, yeah. that's and that's something I see, which is just troubling, very troubling to me. And well, consider, uh, consider, you know, a lot of the basis of our government for the Greco-Roman was influenced by Greco-Roman society. They had something called the dialectic which is two sides get together, actually do what you're saying they should do and come to some type of compromise or some type of middle ground that satisfies the nature of ordered society. That does not happen now, which is the greatest shame. Exactly, because as Aristotle always said, all things in moderation, radicalism, <laughs> yeah. lead to tragedy, yeah. and yeah. regardless of what you, you have to find, things that work for everyone and may not may not agree or everything, but it works for the majority and it works for everyone to allow for, like you said, functioning society to develop. And whenever yeah. one side gets too heavy or, or yeah. in power, it upsets that balance and you have chaos and other problems that will ensue. Yeah. Yep. Dialectic. No. Bring, bring back the dialectic revolution. <laughs> Well, guys, very, very well said, and I really enjoyed the discussion today. It, it's really uh, made me think about a lot of things, and I hope a lot of people can get some insight regardless of your viewpoint. You know, you know, so, you know, I just think we've covered a lot of stuff. It's very in-depth, but all good points, and I just really appreciate you guys coming on for this episode and sharing your points of view and debating this topic, which is, I think, healthy and, and necessary. Yeah. Thank you, Sean, for having yeah. us. Yeah. Thank you. No, but get it out there. Oh, for sure. And my pleasure. And like I said, I'd love to have you and other people on to get different points of view because issues like this, it's interesting to see different people's points of view. And from that, I think you gain a better sense of just what everyone is thinking so you can better understand and come to an appropriate conclusion. And from their actions that you can take to do, I think, do and pursue the greater good in many cases. Right. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Awesome. So again, thank you guys. I really appreciate you joining me on this episode of International Immersion. For everyone listening, feel free to shoot us an email at internationalimmersionpodcast at gmail.com. If you have questions, want to be on the show, or have any other ideas, we'd love to hear from you. Send or you know, check out our social media on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook of International Immersion, the same name, or our LinkedIn page if you want to collaborate. We really appreciate all the all the help and support you guys give us. We're looking to create a lot of new content now, especially with a lot of things going on both in the United States and globally now. And with that, we'll see you on the next one. Stay safe and take care.